Uh, I'd like to call this uh, select board meeting to order on this lovely March 27th. Newman present. Smith present. Cranston present. Everybody is able. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And then, um, have you all had a chance to read our minutes? Yes. I have. Okay, and I would entertain a motion to approve our minutes, our meeting minutes. So moves. Second. All those in favor? Newman aye. Smith aye. Grants and I. Ashley Newman can't. I watched it, which is just as good as being there, <laughs> not better, because you can rewind and listen to everything. What's wrong with you? I don't know what I missed. <laughs> you tried not to let you miss anything, board. huh? She's used to being on the planning board. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry, Kristen. I did not know that. That's all right. All right. And tonight, the first thing on our agenda is the Monty Tech update. So if you want to get to the podium and introduce yourselves and tell us where you would like to start. Good evening, everybody. I'm Tom Brown. I'm the Sun superintendent at uh, Monty Tech, and I'm joined by Tammy Crockett, who is our business manager. Um, we have hopefully a relatively quick presentation, we'll see, um, uh, that we just want to kind of give everybody a basic update on Monty Tech, focusing a lot on um, some of the activities that we've done to supplement uh, our budgets and everything else. And uh, So um, it's the PowerPoint yes. that looks like this, and there are extra copies up at the front yes. if anybody needs to, uh, to follow along. There will be a quiz, so make sure you have it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, to get started, um, what we first want to kind of talk about is, again, one of the things we want to focus on is how we supplement our budget. Uh, we're very fortunate um, that we have a great team that really does a lot of work on grants. So you can see um, the first grant that talks about there is a grant called CTI. It's called the Career Technical Initiative. And what the Career Technical Initiative is actually geared towards adult workforce training. Um, but the benefit of that is we do that at night, and obviously we have our program during the day. So any grant monies that support those types of programs are buying equipment that our day students can use. So you can see there's been four different kind of iterations that we've applied for. Most recently this past summer, uh, we applied for this round eight and we received a $720,000 grant. Uh, again, that was used in our carpentry and our plumbing and our HVAC shops uh, to purchase equipment and supplement materials. Um, it's a great program. Uh, and then if you look at the second slide that's there, it shows the, the graduation that we have. And again, these are a lot of second career folks, folks who maybe, you know, had worked at a warehouse but decided, you know what, I, I want to get into welding. It's a more profitable career. I'm going to at 35, uh, you know, our culinary program, we had one gentleman who was in his 70s, and he still wanted to cook, and we, we let him into the program. So it's for all ages, for adults. But you can see our most recent graduation ceremony, we, we graduated from culinary. CNC, welding, and property maintenance. Our bottom right is the program that's still ongoing. Again, carpentry, electrical, HVAC, and plumbing. And we do a great job with that graduation. It's great. I mean, the, the, the folks, that usually their children's there, their spouses are there. It's just a great celebration of their accomplishment for the workforce training. Um, last year, uh, when I first uh, met with Billy, we were really talking, please talk about an anonymous donation that we had received um, to support our programs. And uh, the idea was is to use that to purchase some cabinet equipment, cabinet making equipment, but then also to um, purchase a brand new auto body spray booth. Uh, the picture on the left there is, is uh, what, what we're looking for the spray booth in terms of, um, this is Bay Pass actually, their spray booth. But we um, put out an RFP, and sometimes as you do, you put out the RFP and you realize, wow, it really costs a lot to put in a brand new spray booth. Um, and we realize even that anonymous donation, we're nowhere near co covering that cost of that anonymous donation. So again, we reached out to what the state has in terms of competitive grants. Uh, the Kenneth Donnelly grant um, was out there. Again, this is a, another adult workforce training. But again, you get that equipment, students can use it during the day. 
So um, we found out last August that we had a $500,000 grant that we achieved from them get to supplement the materials. We are now in a much better place in terms of installing the, the, the booth, um, which is important because literally um, we have the original booth from the 1960s in our shop still, uh, and we basically don't even use it. We basically use it to wash cars in because the, the booth is just really not in great shape. So it'll be great to get this booth in place. Um, it will allow us to start an auto appraisal program for adults, but again, our stewards will get to use it. Uh, the next grant is a little bit smaller grant, you know, still a significant grant, over $100,000, but it's one we're very proud of. Um, the state had reached out and said, we're looking for people who are willing to train a portion of the workforce that unfortunately is really being ignored. And that portion is um, adults, young adults with disabilities. Uh, we're talking about autism, we're talking about social emotional issues, kind of prevent them from working in a regular environment typically. Um, we partnered with two collaboratives, uh, CAPS Collaborative from Westminster and the ARC in Fitchburg. Um, they will have adult students. You can see that they're going to be between 18 and 35. Um, they're coming with, with different disabilities. Uh, we're going to train four different areas, culinary and hospitality, uh, office and copy center uh, assistance. That's our graphic communications program will do that. And then our business technology will do retail and customer service. The kids will get seven weeks of technical training in the program, how to, how to do these employable skills. They'll get a full week of professional skills. How do you work in a, how do you operate in a, in a workforce environment? How do you work with a colleague? You know, that kind of thing. Um, the best part about it is at the end, we give them a two week paid internship where they'll be working with a company. And then um, after that, they're placed with an actual company for a full-time job, hopefully. And we gave you three examples of companies that have already said, so the Colonial Hotel and Gardner, Red Apple Farm in Hannaford has already said they would take these folks after the training program. What we were most proud of was when we found out after the fact that Monty Tech was the only regional vocational, vocational in general, that decided to step up and, and support this program. So we take that grant with great pride and it's going to be fantastic. We're meeting all the students tomorrow, so that's going to be fantastic. Um, also, just want to let everybody know, shops in general go out and try to get grants, individual grants. This was a small example. The ICAR Certified Technicians uh, Collision Repair Education Foundation, the $25,000 grant. But that's the kind of thing we supplement so we don't have to tax the towns as much with different expenses. We have a quick graph there that shows um, the amount of we received in grants uh, last year, $1.9 million. I'll be talking about where that's going. Uh, and then this year, we already have about $1.4 million. And we're just waiting to hear about this outstanding grant. Um, it's for our culinary program. Uh, the trend in culinary is food trucks. And our goal is to try to design a Monty Tech food truck so our students get to know the experience of what it is to run one of those. Because as you know, they're everywhere. So um, we're hoping to hear about that grant very soon. We do get allocation grants as well. If you, The most uh, notable one for vocational education is the Perkins grant. It's federal monies brought down to the states, and then the states then dole it out to the region, or any vocational, it could be a comprehensive school. If they have a vocational program, they can access Perkins. You can see one of the things on the next slide that we use it for a lot. You know, we get about almost $300,000 in grant money because um, the money has been going up. But a very important thing for our students are IRCs, all right, industry recognized credentials. But those are, those are the different certifications that the kids can earn, and often means they have to sit for a test or do a performance test or something like that. But they can get those certifications, which make them truly um, employable out in the workforce. So it's a very important thing. So that's why we dedicate over $100,000 of those Perkins funds to pay for all these tests and exams and everything so our kids can immediately be out there and be workforce ready. Uh, moving on from grants, one of the things we were really proud about the fact that, again, trying to save money, trying to work on that. Um, assuming most of you have heard of MassSave, it's a consortium that has you know, Unitil and Eversource and the other, some of the other utility companies. Uh, we worked with them uh, last fall, we got a call, and they wanted to let us know that of all the commercial um, organizations that they work with, we were picked as one of 14 organizations, only 14 organizations in the Commonwealth, to be a MassSave climate leader. And that was because of the steps we take to be energy efficient, to make sure our building is used in the best way that we can. It's a pretty old building, uh, 1965, but it's hanging in there. But it, behind the walls, another thing. We'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but it's doing great. Um, energy efficient, in the, the second bullet there that talked about the fact that they were really pleased with the fact that we're training our students, the future, the future workers, how important it is to be energy efficient and to use those skills in the workforce. 
So again, just opportunities to uh, save more money. I'm going to quickly go through the next four slides talk about what is our big initiative um, that's been happening recently. Again, we got that $1.9 million grant, and it was an infrastructure grant, and what you're using it for, everybody knows the problem with vocational education now um, is capacity. Uh, this most recent, fresh, our current freshman class um, had 360 spots, uh, and they were, we had 850 applicants for those 360 spots. So we have to say no to hundreds and hundreds of kids. Um, so what we did is we took a look at some of the, the, pro, the districts that we work with that have the highest wait lists, and we partnered with them. And what we're going to do is what we're calling the Montachusett Vocational Partnership Academy, MVP Academy. We use this grant to rent a warehouse about a mile down the road from Monty Tech. Our students and instructors are currently converting that open warehouse into three vocational programs, electrical, house carpentry, and plumbing. The students from those sending districts will remain enrolled in their sending districts. They are, therefore, all the Chapter 70 money stays in those districts. However, they'll spend one week, it's juniors and seniors. The juniors, for instance, will come to us. They get on our buses. Our drop buses drive through these towns anyhow. They'll get on our bus. They go to get, to get vocational training. The seniors are back in their home district doing academics. And then just like our, our day program kids, they flip and they do the exact same thing. Uh, it's a very innovative initiative. When you approach the state, you can see it's what it's really is called an after dark program, which typically happens at night, but we said we're going to do it this way because our kids, these kids, can't do these kind of things at night. They're, they're doing second jobs. They're, they're taking care of their siblings, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so the grants has allowed us to do this. We're not using any Chapter 70 money ourselves to pay for this because we realize what we're hoping to do, get this off the ground, works well, and then we start driving around and we've come to Sterling, for instance, and we say, do you have any building that has empty office space? Because we have a practical nursing program that desperately needs space, that kind of thing. But we just got to see if this is going to work first. But our goal is to start seeing if we can set up satellite campuses in more of our sending towns. So that's kind of the plan. But this is the program right now. You can see the design of the building, where the three shops are going to look like. You can see what the warehouse looked like uh, empty when we first started. Um, and then there's some of our kids. You know, the bottom left was a perfect example. We had to do floor cutting because we had to uh, build um, ADA compliant bathrooms. Uh, we were thinking about, can our kids do the floor cutting themselves? And our instructor said, darn straight they can. And we actually rented the material, ourselves, the equipment ourselves. We cut the floor ourselves, it went perfect. We saved $5,000 because our students and instructors are doing it. So we're really proud of this program. We look forward to seeing how it will grow as we get going. It should be opening up okay, wood this fall. Um, quickly, what I just uh, wrap up with a couple other things. Quickly, just want to talk about admissions because, again, we talked about the concern is how many people we have getting, on the, uh, getting in and being on the wait list. We just like to show how much we've changed our policy just in the last four years in terms of admissions. You know, you can see what we really took a look at, trying to make sure if there's any issues of bias, we expanded the range that you get full points, uh, basically doubling it in size, um, you know, in terms of the academic piece. For the unexcused absences, we doubled that. Because again, we really looked at absences and during COVID, we really learned that that could be something that involves bias because our low-income families don't have the money sometimes to go to their doctors just to get a doctor's note to excuse an absence. And that's pretty important because we ex any any excused absence, the sending district, if they say it's excused, we don't. That's it. We don't ask any other questions. So we said, let's expand that so that's more fair. Discipline, basically, nobody loses points for discipline anymore. The only thing we count for discipline are what's called the big three, chapter 37, H and a half, which is if you bring drug, you sell drugs at school, you bring a weapon to school, or you assault a staff member. And there's not a whole lot of 7th and 8th graders, thankfully, that are doing that anytime soon. So really, nobody loses points for discipline anymore. Uh, we looked at the school recommendation. Guidance counselors used to write a recommendation. We realized we had 42 different people writing those recommendations. And there really was not a lot of consistency. We had some districts where the guidance counselors gave their kids full scores all the time. Every single kid got a full score. Whereas other ones were being very critical and they were holding them. Some of them were giving zeros to kids. 
So we said, this is just, it's not a good thing. So we got rid of the, the school recommendation. Guidance counselors think we're happy to have that burden off of their shoulders. But what we brought in was the interview, because the interview was the opportunity for that kid to come in and say, why do they want to be at Monty Tech? What do they want to do there? So we've done all those changes for the missions, and we're very happy with that. Uh, Co-op, that's when our upperclassmen get to get um, jobs. And so instead of going to shop, they actually go out to the workforce. You can see our numbers are way up. We're actually closer to 220, 230 right now. Um, the one problem with that, and it's getting to the outside long, is we have so many kids that are working at co-op that our crew is doing a lot of the outside work. We don't have much of a crew because they're all going out on co-op, getting paid. So um, that's, uh, that will come up in just a bit when I get to it. Um, Post-secondary partnerships, again, you can just check, check and see. We've got a great relationship with Worcester State, looking at we're doing more dual enrollment and more early college programs. This chart, the blue, uh, green chart and everything else, the reason why we get this out there is when people talk about vocational education these days, we get very concerned because they talk about, well, no one's going into the workforce anymore. They're all going into college. And that is just not true. That's not the case. That being said, if you're concerned about kids going into college, then you have an old version of, of vocational education in your head. We're no longer just the construction trades. We have kids in engineering, we have kids in nursing programs, we have kids in IT that have to get additional education in order to do well. You know, if you look at up top on that, where the blue ones, these are the ones where you, ex where you would typically expect the kid to go on to college. So a kid who from our animal science program, when they graduate, they have a vet, ass vet assistant certification. They can go get a job immediately. They're going to get paid $16, $17 an hour, which is going to be about $34,000, $35,000 a year. They can't live on that. In order to become a vet tech, which is where they start making money, they need to go get at least two more years of college. That's just the way it is. You know, our health occupations kids, when you go down to health services, it shouldn't be any surprise that 24 of the 25 kids had to go on to college. Same thing. When they finish our program, they have a CNA. They can go work at a nursing home. They're going to get paid $16 or $17 an hour. And that's just not a wage that they can live in. In order to get their PN, they need to go on to college. So you just have to understand that we're not the same um, vocational program that was, that was back in the day. That being said, if you go to the, sec the second page of that chart, where you see the orange, these are the shops where you would expect a kid to go right into the workforce. Oh, I'm sorry, you don't have the color on here for some of you, so I'm sorry. Um, yeah, you cheaped out on that. Ah, sorry. Uh, so under the transportation, um, you know, under manufacturing engineering, and certainly under construction, I mean, the fact that 16, of the, 16 out of 16 of the plumbers went right into the workforce, all right? 14 of the auto tech kids went right into the workforce. Where you expect them to be going into the workforce, they're going into the workforce. So that's just we want to make sure that it understands when people say, well, they're all going to college. It's, one, it's not true. And secondly, in some cases, the kids have to go on to college. And then last but not least, we love doing projects. Uh, you can see, and this goes back to why I have been worried about co-op. Uh, last year, we had worked with Billy to do the memorial wall over at Peg's Pond. And it was right at the end of the year, and our masonry basically went down to they had two kids working because everybody else was on co-op. I was thrilled that we were able to get right back in here in August and September and finish that, finish that wall and get it done. Uh, but if you have other projects, other jobs, reach on out. We'd love to help you out. So, um, so that's just a qu hopefully relatively quick summary of where we are and what we're doing. And if there's any questions, I will turn it over to Ms. Crockett to go through the budget. Okay. I'm going to continue on in the PowerPoint. Uh, for my budget presentation, but you also have the um, budget book, which is a lot more detailed than what the PowerPoint is that I'm going through. So feel free to ask me questions from either, but I'm okay, continuing. Yeah, one second. Before anybody asks questions, please know that you need to be recognized by the chair before you start on chairing. Because it's the one you're going to start on. <laughs> Okay, so I'm starting on the slide that says FY25 Foundation Budget. This is really the blueprint of our budget. Um, so the state sets a foundation budget for every school district in the Commonwealth, and they base it upon, and I'm sure, I apologize, I'm sure this is repetitive because you've heard what you said speak already. So again, I apologize for any repetitiveness. Uh, the foundation budget is based on grade levels for students. You can see across the top. 
And then down the rows, um, there's different foundation categories, which get rates assigned per pupil to it. So you can see from Monty Tech, all of our students are in the vocational column, and we have 1476. This is foundation enrollment, so this is not just the pupils that reside in our 18 communities and are enrolled at Monty Tech. This also includes the pupils that are, reside in our 18 communities that school choice out to another vocational school. Um, that gets counted in there, as well as we have the Chapter 74 Practical Nursing Program, so a small number of in-district pupils that are in there get added to this count. So then we get a per-pupil rate um, going down. It is worth noting vocational education is the most expensive model of education, not counting special education. Moving over to columns 8 through 13, this is where the state gives you money, what they call above base. So it's duplicative counts of students that are already in seven, but you get additional monies in certain categories because it is more expensive um, to educate certain populations of students. So you can see in column 8, our special ed in district. Now, that 73 is not representative of the number of special ed students we have in Monty Tech. We have 234 students on IEPs. This is an assumed percentage that the state puts in there. So for vocational districts, it's at 4.93%. For non-vocational districts, they uh, use 3.93% there. So again, that's an assume, that's just a percentage number they use for everybody up there. So you can see we get additional monies there. We have no st student special ed tuition now because you need to be able to be at Monty Tech to, to be a Monty Tech student. So there's none there. RELs, we have 10, and they, those are listed in the high school vocational column, column 12. So you get additional monies there. Uh, the last column for additional funds is for your low-income students. So you can see by here, they've listed us at 500. And how the state gets that number is we upload our student roster um, to the state. And then they go out through their databases and they find, they match the students who are on Mass Health, transitional assistance, get EBT, all the, all the assistance programs. They match those and they fill that number in. One thing to know is if you look at row 15, it says low income group six. It's in a uh, little box. Several districts in the Commonwealth this year went down a low income group because um, during COVID, Mass Health kind of maintained their certification process for people being eligible for assistance. What they've done this year that they haven't done since I believe it's 2017 was Mass Health changed the recertification process. So it used to be if you were 133 percent below the federal poverty level, you were qualified as low income. Now you have to be 185 percent below the federal poverty level to get counted in that group. So why is that important for us? Well, low income groups are numbered 1 through 10, 10 being the highest percentage of low income groups in your district. You get more money per pupil in that column the higher the group you're in. Monty Tech went from a 7 last year to a 6 this year because of that. So we lost $225,000 in our foundation budget because of that change. Several other districts did as well to the tune of millions and millions of dollars. So that's just something of no. Um, but anyways, going over to the final column, this is where everything gets added up and it comes down to row 12, which is our foundation budget. That's for us, this FY25, it's 29,900,307. 
when you divide that out by the number of students, it comes up to 20258 per pupil, foundation budget spending per pupil. The next slide will show how our Chapter 70 funds are calculated against that foundation budget. You can see row one, uh, that's our current Chapter 70 money for FY24. Rows two through five calculate what we're going to get for Chapter 70 this year. So they take our foundation budget, they subtract out the required district contribution. So that's all 18 communities that belong to Monty Tech. They calculate everybody's required district contributions individually. Then they add our 18 up and they come up with this 11648232, which we'll see in another slide. When you subtract the two, you come up with our chapter 70 of 18252075. Well, this is less than what we're getting in FY24. So we are considered a hold harmless district us and 220 other districts in the Commonwealth this year. So what that means is the state says, you're already getting more Chapter 70 than we think you should get in, F in FY25. You're getting more in FY24. We're not going to cut your Chapter 70. You're only going to get what's called minimum aid, which is row 6, which is $30 per pupil. So they take your pu number of pupils times 30, and that's what they come up with, the $44,280. So that brings us to our Chapter 70 money for FY25 of the $18,362,984. I'm going to move over to the next column. We, for FY25, we talked about enrollment. We talked about foundation budget. We hit briefly on district contribution. We just talked about Chapter 70. Now I want to point out our required net school spending. You can see that our money tax required net school spending for FY25 is $30,011,216. Normally, and if you compare 24, you'll see what I'm talking about, net school spending and foundation budget are usually one and the same. It's usually the same number. It's not for districts that are in hold harmless. Because what the state's saying is, we're giving you more Chapter 70 than we've calculated you should get, so we expect you will spend it all. And net school spending is the required minimum that the state mandates a school spend that cannot include capital, debt service, transportation, or student meals. So again, that's, that's our base right there. Now I'm going to go to the next slide entitled FY25 Budget Summary to show you how that comes into play for Monty Tech's FY25 budget. Going down that column, we talked about the net school spending requirement, the $30 million. Transportation, that's our contractual agreement with our bus companies for our 30 buses and three vans that get our pupils to and from school every day. We are in 25 will be the second year of our new bus contracts and it represents a 4% increase in the contract over FY24. There's also some increases built in there um, to our special education transportation costs as well. Our above net school spending. So this is where our budget, our operating budget is above the 30 million. You can see our above is 296,948. That's 0.9% above. It's less than a percent above our requirement. We, we try to stay as close to that as possible as our requirement. Capital budget, if you take that and vehicles, which are both capital items, total 510,000. Compare that to the current years of 500,000, we're proposing an increase of 10,000. Now what's going into our capital budget for that 460? That is bleachers for the athletic fields, ours are in disrepair very badly. 
Also built into that is 25000 going into our stabilization account, which I'll talk about on the next slide, as well as 15000 going into our OPEP trust fund. That gives us a total proposed budget for FY25 of $33,334,174, which is about an $800,000 increase, or 2.46%. And you can see a lot of that really is driven. Our net school spending goes up almost 2%. So a lot of that's driven there. The next component, again, we talked about Chapter 70. We've talked about the required minimums that will get more in depth. So the first outside, so we, so our assessment is made up of four components, required minimum. We'll talk about Sterling's in another slide. Second, transportation and other, which is this next section here. How we arrive at that portion is we add the transportation from above to the above net school spending, come up with the 2.8 million. From that, we subtract our transportation aid from our cherry sheets. So you can see that's 1.9. We also have a regional transportation reimbursement revolving fund. So regional schools, as you're well aware, get reimbursed a percentage of our transportation costs. Well, if we, when we budget for transportation in a fiscal year, so now I'm going to point out FY24. We've budgeted 1.7 million. As the year goes through, you start to get better estimates from the state of what you actually will get for transportation. Unfortunately, the last payment comes in June, so you really have to wait till the end of the year. But what the school committee has done is they've established the regional transportation account so that if we get more money than we budgeted of 1.7 million, that money gets put in this regional transportation fund instead of rolling into E&D. What you have to do with that regional transportation fund is use it in the following fiscal year, so in this case FY25, to reduce community assessments for transportation. So we are banking, betting, hoping, that we're 150000 over our current year's budget. So we are you putting that in to offset community assessments in transportation for FY25. We're also proposing to use 250000 of our excess and deficiency account. And again, I'll speak more of that on the next slide. So that leaves the transportation and other operating net assessment to our communities 487958 The third component of our assessment is capital. So you can see that's derived by adding capital and vehicles to get the 510. We're also proposing using 200,000 from E&D to reduce that to bring us to 310,000 for a net assessment to all communities on that piece. The fourth would be bonds. We don't currently have any, so there's zero there. So adding those components up, it gives us a total assessment for all communities of $12,446,109, which is about an increase of $455,000. The next slide, will I'll touch upon those accounts I just talked to you about. Certified excess and deficiency. So uh, regional school districts can have 5% of their budget in this account, up to a maximum of 5%. This year, because every year it has to be certified by the Department of Revenue, this year our E&D was certified at $1,304,918. We're using 450000 of that. So that's leaving us a balance of 2.6% in E&D. So a little for that in case of emergencies and um, the rest, the other amount to reduce community assessments. The second account I talked to you about was stabilization account. So that's for capital purposes. We try to maintain a stable capital assessment to our communities every year. So we try to keep it at that 
500,000 mark every year. So we try to build in our capital maintenance into that, but it's not always possible to do that. Um, what Tom referred to earlier is we're going out for engineering services for our main electrical gear, which is there. The building was actually probably built around our electrical room. So it's extremely old, and we know there's going to need a lot of updates to it. That is probably going to be somewhere in the realm of 750 to a million. So we have, we had we we're slowly built up this stabilization fund to offset assessments when that bill comes up, so that we can maintain a stable assessment to our communities. The third component is our OPEB account, 21,919. My joke is it's small, but we have one. <laughs> um, so those are those accounts. The next slide is our summary by function code. So really this is a four year snapshot of our budget spending by function. You can look to see kind of the comparison between FY24 and FY25 to see where the large spending changes are from year over year. And again, the budget book you have on separate is more detailed. We'll provide you more details on this. This is just more a high level overview. But to break down our budget drivers, on the next slide, you'll see that the large increases that really make up that $800,000 increase is salaries. So FY25 is going to be year two of our three-year collective bargaining agreement with the two unions we have, which are the teachers and the custodians. So we have 3% COLA built in. We, we asked the school committee to give every staff person a 3%, whatever the teachers negotiate. So it's a 3% across the board from admin to support staff to everybody. So that's representative in this number. Plus step and column movements for those that it's applicable for teachers, custodians. I talked to you about pupil transportation, year two of our contract, and our special ed increase. So that's about 117000 the next component is technology. So when you look in our technology lines, you'll see that we have some changes to that spending. Some big ticket items in there is our network is at end of life. So we need to replace cores, switches, wire well, access points. The next major component to it is our cybersecurity protection account and I, I know Tom likes to speak to this. A yeah, we just as we've been going around to all the different towns and communities, we've been making sure that everybody knows it's, it's public. We've already uh, informed all our families and our staff. Uh, last October, unfortunately, we were a victim of a cybersecurity attack. Um, due to the great work of our IT crew, we were able to save all our data. We didn't lose any of our data. We didn't have to pay any ransoms or anything like that. But it was a significant wake-up call that we, even though we thought we had a lot of good stuff, we didn't have enough uh, in place to make sure we could do that. Um, we had to send out notifications to about 8,000 people because it affected them in that way. Um, not that it definitely had, but you have to always cover yourselves. Um, so we, we, we decided you'll see a lot of the technology numbers if you look at the full budget um, are because you know now we are having a service contract with someone who's outside our, our building who monitors the, um, the firewall. Uh, we purchased more hardware that's going to bulk things up and everything else. So um, it's money well spent, we think, because uh, woe to anyone who goes through it. Hopefully you never have to worry about it. Uh, the one other piece that Tam will speak to is get insurance. <laughs> Yeah, we've, we have Maya um, for our liability and um, all of our insurances through the school. And thankfully through them, we have cyber liability insurance. So I'm kind of touting that everywhere we go as well. Make sure you have it. They provided us with the legal firm who set up the Aquiron account, who sent out all the notifications. We provided the info. They sent out all the notifications to the people. They filed reports with the AG's office. They did all of the legal stuff. They also provided us with um, cyber forensics who are out in California who specialize in this. And that would have been hundreds, 
uh, you know, tens to $100,000 worth of um, expenditures, if not for our liability insurance. So we're very thankful for that. So we just spread the word on that. Um, the next slide I'm going to is contributions by member city or town. I told you we'd talk about the required minimum contributions because that's the bulk of the community's assessment. So you can see, looking at Sterling, your foundation enrollment number went from 61 to 66, which is a change of five students. So you can see the state calculated your minimum contribution to go from 983,550 to 1,098,747, or an increase of 115,197. The next two slides really focus on how the state comes up with that number. Of course, they, the state has a um, wealth model that they use to calculate a community's ability to pay. Um, they use three items, property value, income of the citizens and a municipal revenue growth factor. So on the first slide, you can see rows one through three. That's how they calculated Sterling's ability to pay based on your property values. So they use 22 valuations. You can see the number. They multiply that by a, a uniform percentage. That 0 .3902 is used for every community in the Commonwealth, A to Z, it's the same percentage. So you can see the local effort from property wealth is 5,615,257. Then four through six, they're using the 2021 income of citizens. You can see the number. Again, the uniform percentage, 1.4299%. That's used for every community, A to Z, same number and they've calculated Sterling's effort from income, 6,976,102. So to come up with row seven, what they call your combined effort yield, they simply add three plus six to get that number. Eight and nine, they calculate, they say what is Sterling's portion of the foundation budget for all the schools they belong to. And again, you represent 13,093,569 of the foundation budgets for Monty Tech, Wachusett, and I believe you have an Aggie, a student at an Aggie school, or one or two. Yeah. Okay. So they take that, that's the 13 million. They multiply that, row nine, eight by 82.5%. Reason being is, I guess in this case, we'll say Sterling, <laughs> wealthier communities that they've calculated can afford to pay more, they say we're at least going to give that community 17.5% state aid chapter 70. So they've calculated that number to be 10,802,195. They take the lesser of nine or seven, so in this case, that's the 10,802,195. Then we come over to current day, I guess. So they say row 13. What is Sterling, what were they required to contribute in 24? 10,317,629. They multiply that by the municipal revenue growth factor. You sitting here probably know that formula better than I do. It's done by the Department of Revenue, and it takes factors into play about your levy limits, new growth, new revenues, um, different things like that. That percentage is different for every community. So 4.29% is what the Department of Revenue has calculated for Sterling. They multiply that into the um, row 13, and they come up with your preliminary contribution for FY25 of 10,760,255. Then when we go down to rows 21 through 27, they say, how does that number that we just calculated compare to over in row 10, what we said you can afford to pay? Well, in this case, it's less 
but it's just a little less. It's 41,940 less, or 0.32%. So, when you look at um, 23 and 24, if you're basically under um, the 2.5%, there's no additional increments added on. So Sterling is strictly going to have for their required minimum contribution, row 26, 10760255 the next slide shows you how that gets apportioned out to the school districts that you belong to. I'm going to look at rows 5 through 10 because that deals with FY25. So 5 just simply brought that 10 million number forward from the previous slide. FY25 foundation enrollment. You can see the 1 for your Aggie, 924 for Wachusett, and 66 for Monty Tech. Then they come up with the foundation budget that Sterling represents from each of those schools. So in Monty Tech's case, I, I told you at the start of my presentation, our foundation budget spending per pupil was $20,258 on that very first slide. They multiply that by the number of pupils Sterling has, and that's how they come up with your portion of our foundation budget as 1,337006. And they do the same for the other two schools as well. Then they say what percentage is each school of the whole. So in this case, Monty Tech represents 10.21% of the, the whole foundation budget picture. So what they do there is they take you, what your required minimum is from row five, and they multiply that by 10.21%, and that's how they come up with row nine, FY25 required contribution. Same formula for each of the other two schools as well. So you can see that's how they arrived at it. So it's an increase, again, as we pointed out, 115,197. The next slide is me breaking out Sterling's assessment and the components from year to year. So looking at FY25, we talked about your foundation budget, 66 kids times 20,258. Required minimum contribution, we just saw how that was calculated. Sterling's portion of our transportation and operating assessment is 21,819. Sterling's portion of our capital assessment is 12,116. So when you add the required trans the transportation and the capital, you get a proposed FY25 assessment of 1,132,732, which is an increase of 114,501. So it's actually less of an increase than your minimum contribution increase was the way Sterling's percentages fell for the um, whole of Bonnie Tech's budget. The next slide is just that same kind of calculation done, but for every community. So you can see how it happens. The only numbers I really haven't spoken to you about that's on this slide is looking at Sterling and looking kind of in the first column. We talked about 66. 66 is representative of 4.47% of the total foundation Roman of 1476. So you represent 4.47% of that transportation and operating assessment. The next number, 979, is your school attending children number, grades 1 through 12. So these are all, all students eligible, whether they are enrolled at Wachusett, in private schools, homeschooled, school choice, they're there. I get that number from the superintendent of schools office. And then the next number, 3.92%, that's the percentage that Sterling represents of the whole. So 979 into the 24,956. This number is important in two ways. It's the portion of your capital assessment, as well as your portion of the freshman class. 
So that becomes your quota. So at the March school committee meeting, the school committee voted to take in a freshman class of 355 students. So Sterling will represent 3.92% of that, and that becomes your freshman class quota. That's the only numbers I hadn't pointed out on that slide. And to end my presentation, I just wanted to give you a comparison of where Monty Tech stands in with all the other um, vocational technical schools in the state. This data is from DESE. It's FY21 data, which is the most up-to-date that they have. It's per pupil expenditures. And you can see that Monty Tech falls in about the middle of the pack of all the vocational schools in our per pupil spending. That's my presentation. Um, and I'll pass out the quiz. <laughs> yes. It's going to be on the formula stuff. So. <laughs> Yeah. Not really. It's a great presentation. Oh, thank you so much. Really well. Um, thank you. I'm just curious to. I don't know if you probably don't have the information, but I'm wondering how many Sterling students apply. Like, do we know how many are applying versus how many are? <laughs> Off the top of my head, so Sterling usually has a quota somewhere around. 12, 13, 14 kids. Yeah. Um, I would say that your wait list is not a super long wait list. I'd say maybe a dozen kids. So I would say around 20 to 25 students a year probably are applying somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. David, did you have a question? How do you determine which one of those students gets denied? Um, so basically, there's uh, criteria that includes uh, that, that chart that I showed you that had academics attendance so there's point values for all that that weighs together um, and that becomes the school the, their the kids total score um, based on that score we kind of rank them and it kind of works down from there and if they if a student if we have several students that tie it becomes a lottery Correct. so if eight of those kids all have the same score they're just pulled if a student moves or, or transfers out of the school as an open position, are you able to bring in? So we, we switched that is a great question because a couple years ago we realized one of the things that was very difficult to towns was you would say every year, okay, we know we're going to have 12, 13, 14 kids go. But we had something in place where if a town didn't fill its quota, we would just take from the top of the list. So if you just happen to have five or six kids at the top list, so... Um, I mean, one of your neighbors, Holden, never had met their quota until last year. Last year was the first time they met their quota. And they would miss it by a lot. So they would have 20 spots wide open. So we would take the first 20 kids off. You may have budgeted for 12 kids to go, but now four more kids are going simply because they were at the top and you hadn't budgeted for that. So a couple of years ago we said, listen, if a Sterling kid leaves, they're replaced by a Sterling kid. And that's the way it works now. So it's always, that's the way it works down. So you can know pretty consistently what you're going to have um, for a class. You can, you can still get above your quota because, occasionally, occasionally because Harvard doesn't fill all their slots, right. which is open, which has about, what, six or eight slots open. Yeah, open. And Holden is now, they filled their quota last year. But they so didn't now they're, they didn't this year, but they're running closer. Um, so we might only have five. So, so you would really fill your quota just by if they if your students happen to be on the wait at the top of the general wait list for just those open seats from Harvard and Holden rather than when the kid leaves from Fitchburg and now your kids are next on the spot. We so. do also take tenth graders. So if we have open spots, um, same kind of thing. They apply from all the towns, and, and we can go from. So we do a, to accept tenth graders as well. You know, we have no objection to our kids getting into one of the Holden spots and Holden paying for it. <laughs> we could ask. Okay. We'll see what <laughs> uh, don't even ask. Just, just do. do it. Yes. We'll call Mr. Yeah. Challenger from Holden and take it. Okay. Just to piggyback off the question of how you choose the students, yep. do you ever make exceptions? Let's just say a student is really failing and they're not showing up to school because they can't deal with the. They would really 
prefer that vocational experience and they might thrive there. So how do you make that determination that a child doesn't fit in based on their current grades and attendance if you are what they need? So you just give the perfect example. So if they're not attending school, and maybe it is because they're, they're just not interested in what they're doing and it will improve. Um, we did a survey of all our co-op um, industry partners and we said, here's a bunch of traits. What is the number one most important trait that we should absolutely be considering when kids are coming here? The number one trait was attendance. Because they said, I can train a kid if he shows up to work, but if he doesn't come to school, that's not the kid type of kid that we're going to want working for us because I can't train that kid. But he may show up if he likes may, the program. But he, that you <laughs> but he may not. Uh, and that's okay. why, and to be perfectly honest with you, one of the things that uh, we find is that a lot of the schools that feed into us um, they use us as a motivator. They say to the kid, you want to go to Monty Tech, you got to work on those grades, you have to work on those, um, the, the attendance. You know, the grades piece is a huge piece. If you don't know, uh, like what I kind of described for what we're doing MVP is, you have academics one week and you have shop the next week. You get academic work during shop week and you have to do that independently and bring that work in because we have half the time that everybody else does to prepare a kid for MCAS because they're spending half their time in shop. So there's a lot of work. If you're not a kid who can balance that work and do that work independently, you're going to struggle. And that's actually one of the number one reasons why kids leave because they just can't handle the A week, B week. Mm -hmm. okay. Ray? So how does school choice or the choice of opting out because there's another school that has uh, the course you want. We have a couple students we're paying for. Um, how does that fit into the whole selection process? Like, maybe they get not accepted as one of the top ones to fit your quota. Can they choose another school and then you have to pay for it? Yes, so what happens is we do not accept freshman school choice because we're oversubscribed from our district town, 850 for 360 spots. So as a school, we don't accept freshman school choice students. So they can't come in under your quota on the freshman class. So, but if our student chooses another school that does accept freshmen, yep. and they get accepted at that school, yes. then we're liable so to So then what them. happens is it becomes part of your foundation enrollment number to Monty Tech, and you pay Monty Tech through your assessment process. And then from our Chapter 70 funds, they take the school choice money from us to pay. To, that kid goes to Neshoba Tech. They take the money from us and pay Neshoba Tech for that student. The only different situation would be your Aggie student. You direct, as I believe the town has to approve of that request. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. They, we don't ever see those kids. They apply right to an Aggie. It's not factored into school choice because it's considered like a non-resident. Aggies are like non-resident vocational schools. So the towns are directly billed for those. So is our town billed exactly what you have to pay the other school? No. So what happens in school choice is it's $5,000 <coughs> what we pay the other school. There's also some additional money second factored in if it's a special education student. They, you do a report and you say what services you are providing special education students. And you can get a special ed increment added to it. So we, we could start with a base of 5000 and pay uh, school choice like 12, 13, 14, 15,000 out. Um, so you're your town is built at your 20,000 per student. Actually, for, for what, it, what comes out of your town, I say ta tax base, is 17,163. So you're built by us, the 17,163, and then we pay the five, six, seven, the whatever monies to the other school that the student's actually residing. Same thing holds true backwards. We have students who school choice in Demonte Tech. The reason we accept sophomores through senior school choice is because we don't want a student from Sterling who went there
freshman, sophomore, junior year, moved to Paxton or Rutland, and all of a sudden they can't go to Mountain Tech anymore when they've been there their whole high school career. So we, we tend to have the space there, so we, that's why we accept school choice at those levels. So again, we have, we have some students who are from Leominster, say, because they started as a Fitchburg kid at Mountain Tech, and they moved to Leominster. So same thing holds true for them. They keep the chapter set, Leminster keeps the chapter 70. They get that and then they pay us five. That's how it works with Wachusett as well. If you have school choice in students um, from other communities that school choice in through Wachusett, you, the school district gets the 5,000 or increment per kid. If you have some Sterling kids who choose to go to, I don't know, Worcester, I don't know, just another comprehensive district, you get the Chapter 70 for that kid, and then Wachusett pays that other school district 5000 So it's kind of like a highway going both directions. Because we have two students that were paying $80,000 a year for Yeah, that's your <laughs> Aggie school, I'm going to guess. Yeah. yeah. Is it? Oh, that's yeah. the Aggie Yes. Right. And, and, and the biggest piece of that is the transportation. Yeah. Huge. Car. Yeah, we, we've seen, uh, as I mentioned to Billy, um, one of our towns, the kid has gone to an Aggie. He's, it's, it's up by us, up by, uh, um, you know, further west and north. Uh, he's going to Norfolk Aggie, which is down basically almost on the south shore. They're paying $60,000 a year for that one student. Yeah. And so that doesn't yeah. cut to us. Yeah. That, and that doesn't really, we never even know about that kid, so to speak. Because it wasn't like they tried, you know, they tried to come to mind tech, whatever. They wanted an Aggie, and that's a whole separate so ballgame. So basically, if a school accepts the student, then you're responsible for it. So it's, it's really the school that's doing the accepting that... Correct. That, uh, makes the decision, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah, every, every, di every district is required in the spring to announce whether or not they're accepting school choice. Mm -hmm. So for instance, at our next school committee meeting, Monty Tech will announce whether or not we're accepting school choice, but by grade level. And so. some school districts are very detailed, like, oh, we don't have room for kindergarten kids or eighth graders. So it's by actual grade level of what they'll and, accept. And in that case where, you know, the student moves from Fitchburg to Leominster, do you have the ability to say, okay, we're going to accept this student over some other because he's already in our district or he's already been in our district? Only if they're a sophomore or higher. If they're a freshman in Fitchburg and they move to Leominster, they can no longer attend my hotel. Yeah. Okay. Linda? All set? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, two questions. Uh, I'll, I'll proceed it by that was the absolute best financial presentation by a school that I've seen. Oh my gosh, so thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. The, the question, uh, the two questions I have is. Uh, about six months ago, maybe it was longer than that, there was a legislative scare in the House and Senate about a lottery system. So what has happened with that? I haven't kept track of sure. it since that. Yeah. So. so there was a proposed bill um, that would have all regional vocational schools go to a blind lottery. Um, one of the concerns that came out immediately is if there was a blind lottery, that idea of a quota system would go away. So we wouldn't be able to say to you, Sterling, you can budget for 12 to 15, because if it's a lottery, just by pulling out numbers, it could end up being that 50 kids from Sterling end up going to Monty Tech if 50 kids apply. You know, I don't know if they'd have that, but, but maybe we, you would expect that more would even apply, knowing that's just going to be, hey, might as well throw my name in and see if they pull a name out. So local budgets could get devastated by a blind lottery. Um, right now, that, that bill is still there, still in the House. Uh, I'm sorry, in the Senate, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an associated one in the House as well, but they go through a joint education committee. So it's still there, they're, they're still considering it. Um, from, from what I hear, uh, there's not a lot of support for it uh, in the House. There's some support in the Senate, um, so we don't really know where it's going, but that's, so it's still there, but, but it's not been enacted yet. So it has to be gone to a full vote. Still in committee then at this point in time. It, both it just was approved out of joint committee, but there have but they haven't come up with the next step of who's going to move it forward. So, okay. 
My second question is, since you're a technical school, yes. what is uh, Monty Tech doing to prepare students for AI? Yeah. Good, good question. question. So we, um, we've embraced it in some ways, but we haven't done an official policy because the state hasn't announced that there's policy. And the last thing I want to do is put out, here's what Monty Tech's doing, and then the state puts something out, and we have to pull something back. So, to be honest, the first day when we were doing professional development with our teachers, um, we shared a bunch of the AI sites because, let's face it, it is a great resource for teaching, and you can't deny that, and you want to support that. Um, in terms of AI for the students, um, there are a few sites that we blocked within the building. Um, we're not naive enough to think that people aren't, kids aren't going to go home and access AI in their houses or anything like that. I think you could probably guess which content area. English is the most one that's most worried about AI um, and how it's getting used, but we've been giving them professional development to show here's some of the sites, here's how you can access it, here you, here, how you can check it. So we haven't put up any major obstacles. Um, and again, we're, we're going to wait and see. And for some reason, I feel like the state's going to say, well, we're waiting to see what the federal government announces. <laughs> so it'll be, it might be a while. But um, I do know there are some schools have absolutely blocked AI completely in their districts and everything else. And I'm not ready to go down that road yet. Well, I bring it up because in, uh, industry is broadly okay. embracing is AI. Right here? And, uh, I'm sorry. They're broadly embracing AI and yes. prepare your students for Absolutely. it. I think it's, it's a part, part of the real world. world. Right. It's going to be there. Yeah. All right. Thank you no very problem. much. And as Joe said, it was very good, comprehensive. Thank you. Thank you for having it. us. Yes. Thank you for having us. to come out to Sterling tonight. <laughs> It was the best plans we had all night. That was great, and we thank you very much. It really was. And we'll see you at town meeting. Yes. Yes. So sorry, just uh, beyond the budget conversation. We could have him back to talk to us about it. All right. I wasn't expecting AI to do. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> could be nice. I second that. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. The next thing on our agenda is the articles for our town warrant. And um, I'm going to have Bill go through basically, and then we'll. Uh, how do you want to do it? Do you want to. Just say yes or do them individual. Um, okay. So Article One's the town. Up, up, you say the finance and capital committee. committees met last night and made their recommendations. So I'll I'll let you know those as we get through as well. Um, I'll try and keep notes so I can write this as we uh, do it. So Article One is the town operating budget. Uh, you can see that it has obviously the raise and appropriate number and the additional sums from. Uh, Cemetery perpetual care, um, stabilization, and it's on the back of this water enterprise fund offsets um, and ambulance receipts that go into that. Um, I think we pretty much came up with the agreed um, town operating budget number, so uh, finance committee recommended approval five to one on that. I don't know if you want to vote them all at once or if you want to do them individually, so that's up to you guys. All right. Did you have any questions on this, Kristen? Yeah, last, last night we did this, so okay. pretty well versed. All right. And then, uh, David, anything good. from you? All right. I would, so the operating budget, it was five to one. Yep. And do we have a reason on the one? Did they have a reason as one? I think there was... Uh, some issue with the Board of Health budget. Is that the good summary of it? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Second one is the required assessment for Wachusett Regional School District uh, plus the $70,000 for the Vogue School, um, the Chapter 74 non-resident tuition and transportation. Um, so that's ten thousand ten million seven fifteen seven thirty three. Uh, that was unanimously approved by the or recommended by the uh, finance committee. Okay. 
And Linda, you have already approved this, the school committee? Uh, yes, we approved the budget, but what I, I do have a question on, is this the entire the, one article for all of the... No, it's broken up into two. The above minimum contribution is the next one. Um, and so that's where I have a question. We okay. haven't gotten there yet. Um, Hang on. Okay, all right. It involves both of the articles, though. Okay. So the, the required assessment would be debt, um, transportation, the additional vocational cost, and the minimum required uh, for what you said. So that was unanimously recommended. Article 3 is the above minimum contribution of 2977305 which is, uh, as they call it, their discretionary um, combined is what the total Wachusett uh, funding would be. Okay, and the finance board? Uh, unanimously opposed. Do any of you? Okay. And now, Linda. So, uh, the question I had about splitting it up is that the authority uh, does not lie in town meeting to divide the budget in that manner. The authority lies with school committee. So, by dividing the assessment with minimum local required and um, above foundation, you're actually creating confusion for town meeting rather than clarifying the process. Because no matter what, if either part were to be voted down, it would go back to the school committee in order to move forward. So basically, you're giving town meeting a do-over vote on one item. And so to me, that looks like it's unclear on where the progression goes on the budget. Do you follow what I'm, I'm saying there? Yes. It, so if we vote it down? Either part, it would end up back at the school committee's business anyway. So the authority isn't actually the town meeting to divvy it up to that degree. It would actually, because it would have to go back to the school committee no matter what. All right, just I'm not sure if you remember correctly, but um, it was always separated at town meeting, um, and it was just combined probably, I want to say, six years ago. So what and I would say is that just because it was done before doesn't mean that that was correct or transparent. Um, I actually think that I, I used to be a big proponent of keeping them separate because I thought, yes, it's nice to see where all of the pieces go. Mm -hmm. But if the authority doesn't lie with town meeting, it actually obfuscates the process because it's giving this, uh, it's like getting a reconsideration vote without actually calling to reconsider the vote. Because no matter what, it has to go back to the school committee, even if the above portion is voted down. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it was an unclear process from before that got rectified within the past few years by having it as one article. Yeah, I'm not quite sure that I agree with that. But yeah, um, just because it's really up to the voters as to whether or not they want to spend that uh, above budget. Like, yes, we're willing to to give the schools the money for the, um, to operate the schools. But do we want to give them the above and beyond is actually up to the voters and not necessarily the school committee as a whole. In, so that's what it looks like on the surface. Mm -hmm. But when you look at it, the, the above foundation is not truly discretionary. That is where things like the co required contract spending falls in. Um, the increases in transportation, the uh, increases in fuel, um, and these other pieces. So if that portion were to be voted down separately from the MLC, mm -hmm. it would still have to go back to the school committee to address. It's not like you would just get a, a, that part slashed off. We still would have to go back to our budget, reconfigure, and then bring us to a special town meeting in right. order to be approved. Right. Right. And so and if it, the other four towns pass it, we're going right, to Right, I mean, assuming that, right? Yeah. So I'm just looking at how, in terms of the logistics of what you're asking the people to approve, you're actually asking them to approve the whole thing, and that it makes more sense to have it as one lump number that the town can still vote no or still have a recommendation of, of I think they can still do an amendment 
uh, town um, meeting to reduce. Yeah. But to have it as two separate articles, you're having them vote twice on one issue. Actually, three times. How is it three times? Because as a citizen's petition. I oh, well, that's definitely, right. I, I mean, <laughs> however, but. <laughs> Kristen, you have anything to tell me? I trust that Linda knows what she's talking about mm -hmm. when it comes to this. And I, do we know what the other towns are doing? How many of them are separating it and keeping it as one? Or there's one other town? And Rutland have it as one. Rutland used to have it as four individual votes for the, founda the foundation, the transportation, the debt, and then anything above. Um, but they've got it down to one. Uh, Holden is flip-flopped. And so I don't know which way they're going at this point. I, didn't see their town manager yesterday. Uh, I know last year it was one. Yeah. Um, they were in the same boat as us up until about a week or two ago. But they were going to separate it also, Holden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't know what their status is on that. Yeah. Um, and then Princeton has it as an omnibus with their entire operating budget yeah. altogether, which I, I would agree is odd. <laughs> but. Yes, talk about transparency. <laughs> um, and, and usually people can talk to either part at the town meeting, so the school board could speak to the... the um, yeah, that's, that's not... I, I that's not what she is. She's, she's just thinking it... And I, I get that she's thinking it's confusing and that it would have to go. So if we vote down at town meeting that we don't want to spend anything but the foundation money, then it's going back to the school committee, and then it's a special town meeting to move it forward. And if, if the special town meeting isn't called before, what, July 1st, then it would be a 112th budget for the school district, which everybody loses out on that. Um, that's not a, a good way to operate and save money. I always want to avoid this. <laughs> Well, if four other towns have it as one and it all passes, then we wouldn't have that anyway, so I think... I mean, I assume if we combined the two, and it was, it was just the one, that the finance board would not recommend it, and they would still speak out against it at town meeting, and the outcome would be the same regardless, right? So... Can't tell what the voters are going to do. To be honest with you, I well, well actually historically, yeah, historically, um, as much work as the finance committee has done and the school committee and, and this board and Fred and Bill, really doesn't come down to those 24 people. It comes down to the 300. And if you're if you're somebody that has children in the school, um, it's going to pass. I I don't think I've been in town long enough to think of a budget that hasn't passed for the school, so. Um. I just have one other question. If you're separating the Monty Tech Foundation and their both Foundation. No, we like them so much better. But it, I'm just saying, if yes, I understand. separated, yep. then why would this one be? It's the same. Well, theirs is only their foundation and the transportation, so it's. But that's still above foundation. Well, transportation is still in that first article, so it's still in there. So this just happens to be the same number, but it's only one article. Okay, uh, Paul? Sorry. Go ahead, throw it in. I was just saying that there's a lot of different ways you can look at it. And we, can say, we can all second guess how it will be perceived. I can only say from the finance committee, from a particular my perspective, is that when you put a budget together, there's a perception when you're looking at voting it. Most people, if they have kids or teachers, they're going to say, well, how can you say no to the school budget just by itself? Versus, well, wait a minute, we're saying, as a finance committee, we're saying, no, we want to pay this, the teacher salaries. We want to pay the initiative. We want to pay the billing. We're just saying this additional amount that you're asking. And again, we've, and there's, and they've been, I, I just, and and they've been notified before this even happened, the, hey, this is not going to fly. So I want to break into that because there's a false perception that the contracts, the teacher contracts, is part of the foundation budget. It's not. It's the entire budget. You can't just put it only into that MLC. 
that's not where it goes, so we're gonna just not pay people if that above foundation portion, that's where it would be, right? Okay. So, so it's misleading the townspeople to separate them, to separate the two the, into two articles. <coughs> because you cannot break the budget that way in the same, when it comes into a regional and when the, the rubber hits the road, it doesn't split cleanly like that. So are we thinking of splitting it just to make a point? Who decides to split it? Huh? Who made the determination to split it? Um, I think the finance committee recommended it. They have been pushing for two years. Last year we didn't, and this year did. And then obviously we had a citizen's petition that um, looked to split it as well. So. But again, my question is, are we doing it just to try and make a statement and trying to tell the school or the school committee that we want to really tighten up what they do and don't do? Um, personally, I think that Dr. Riley and his team have done a good job in trying to get everything. I mean, they walked in, as we know, they walked into a, uh, a mess, and they're doing the best they can to straighten that out. Um, so, I don't know, do you keep it two, do you go one? Personally, I would go one, and I know nobody, nobody wants to spend these millions of dollars, right? But good schools are good for your community. You know, like, they should be supported. It is, and, I mean, our school committee has put a lot of work into this, too. These are people who reside in our communities and pay taxes as well. You know. They probably don't want to spend it either, but they know what's right for our children, which is good for our community. So, I mean, I think we do the best we can to support, just like we, you know, I, we're very supportive of Monty Tech, and we don't ask them a lot of questions and nitpick them as much. We do nitpick watch you say it, which, I mean, I don't really understand why. But, that's a longer but, story. <laughs> well, sure, but it's a completely different. Anyway, I would say, David. I, I would. I, I would like to see them combined. And I would entertain a motion that we combine uh, article two and three. So moved. Seconded. All those in favor? Newman aye. Smith aye. Cranston aye. Okay. Feel better. All right. Um, so then, finance is not all here. Four. Do they? One, two, three, four, we five? A, we didn't call a public meeting. There's a joint meeting posted. Yeah, we didn't do attendance, but we. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, 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 he had for you. Done a right. joint meeting, so. Yeah. So, uh, how about if we have a poll from finance then as to. Are you going to support this article, which is now just one? I mean, you, you turned down the, um, the fourth one for the above, fun, uh, the above foundation or above minimum requirement. So you did not recommend that. Correct. So do you want to s now is going to be one article. How's the article going to be written? It'll be the entire... What's the verbiage going to be? Are you going to split them out in the wording of the summer? I can do that. So I think we'd like to look at the article before we vote on it, Bill, to be honest with you. Well... We can meet tomorrow if you have to. Um, we can meet tomorrow. You know, a meeting posted. No. And, and we're not... We're, <laughs> We're going to trust that people have done this in the past, can combine this, um, I mean, it really is I not... I break it out probably the same way that Article 1 is written, written by the town, saying that is the different portions, kind of. Yes. The non this, this is the 9 million for this, this is the transportation, or whatever. That makes sense. Yeah. So you'll have four items. So the, the 10 million, or the 9 million, the 977, and the 2.9. That makes sense. And then the total would be... 13 and change. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So we need a motion of whether we're going to approve or not approve from the Finance Committee? 
if, if Bill says we can do that, although we didn't post the meeting. I mean, yeah, we, we did we post, post the meeting for you as, okay. as a joint meeting. All right. You may want to open your portion now. <laughs> yeah. I'll call the Finance Committee uh, to order. Can I have a roll call? Uh, roll call. Kane here. here. Shepard here. Garth here. here. Austin here. Andy here. So we have a quorum. Okay, and so. You've heard the arguments. So we need a motion to approve or not approve? Yeah. I'll make a motion to not approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? It's uh, unanimous <coughs> five. Is somebody one. taking minutes for it? Uh, Do we have to take our own minutes, Maureen? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So just for this. Yeah, Someone can watch this on cable tomorrow or the next day or whatever. Yeah. 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 On it. Can you do it? Yeah. That's right there. Okay. So we didn't open our meeting until now, so I'm really just yeah. correct doing <laughs> the, <laughs> the vote. No, I mean, that's we all. had your other votes anyway. This should be the only vote you needed to take because right. we already had the votes. Correct. Um, so mm -hmm. the next article is the Massachusetts Vocational. Yep, number four is, uh, or I guess three at that point, will be Money Tech. Um, we'll have to redo the warrant, get the town clerk to redo the warrant receipt to um, Massachusetts Vocational Regional School Assessment. So that is the 1,132,732 that was unanimously recommended by the uh, finance committee last night. Okay. Article five is the budget. I have a question for finance. When, when she was giving her uh, financial breakdown of the foundation budget in total, I thought she mentioned the Aggie cost that was already ramped up in the foundation budget aggregate. Did I mishear that? She said that one was not included anywhere. You know, that, that doesn't pick that kid up anywhere. Okay. Yeah. If they were to go to a different one and to show up a Minuteman, whatever, that's different. Okay. Aggies are slightly different. Um, five is the request for a new firefighter that was uh, unanimously not recommended by the Finance Committee. Okay. Uh, unanimously not going for a firefighter or a paramedic? Yep. Even after they um, reduced it from two to one? Yes. All yes. right. How do you feel about this, Kristen? Uh, I'm fine with it. They have to use it. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to have any time to say anything, but I think that we have someone on board before. Yeah, it's not all about the retirement. Right. Um, David? I wanted to see you put two five other numbers. Okay, well, there it is. Uh -huh. Voluntarily, so it does mean, and I think we're aware that, that um, there'll be another request for another one next year. We we all know that finance as well. So I would. Um, Do you um, want to vote those first five? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So four. make a motion that the select board recommend articles one through five. So moved. Any further discussion? Okay, and then we're, that's that was the consent agenda. No, we haven't got there yet. I mean, yeah, that's where we're going next. Stuff, yeah. All right. So for the consent agenda, hopefully they'll all be lumped together. There's 11 of them. Um, Hundred thousand dollars for snow, and everything was recommended. There was one that was a four to two vote on the OPB trust fund. Um, Snow and ice at 100,000, the standard elected, uh, elected officials uh, compensation, light board compensation, 400,000 into the stabilization fund, 160 into the capital investment fund, 217 into the OPB trust fund, 100,000 for the reserve fund, um, 85,000 into the ambulance receipts, or from the ambulance receipts into the capital fund, uh, the 8,700 for the opioid relief account, uh, the acceptance of state road funds, Chapter 90, and the fair share amendment, and the recapture of prior year warrant articles as presented. Okay, so the only one that finance didn't go full boat on was the OPEP trust fund? Yep. 
You're not even going to ask who's against that because I've listened to it for the last few years. So. <laughs> it's the argument of paying it versus pay as you go. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, I would motion the select board recommend Article 6 through 16. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion on any of those? No. Human eye. Right. Our, uh, water operating budget, uh, as presented, there were changes since the last version uh, for the updated water debt. That was unanimously recommended. Water department capital is the next one. Uh, it was a 4-2 vote on the finance committee and a 5-1 vote on the capital committee. Okay. Um Did we talk to DPW about this? About the uh, the four to two, four against? No. We just. What was the problem um, with the the capital? Can I speak? Uh, bond terms, I believe. It was the financing. It wasn't the item. It was how to pay for it. That was the objection. Okay, well, that how to pay for it is not a part. We want to pay for it, Maureen, just differently. But it was payment by borrowing, right? It just to, they wanted to include that it had to be thirty years, and no, so, no, we we talked about either water retained earnings oh. uh, for new water source development or borrowing for that. The two votes against that were. A vote to borrow versus use retained earnings for that. Sorry. That's that's the only Excuse difference. We in, the finance committee voted for paying for every one of those just in a different manner. In a different manner. Okay. Well, that is actually kind of a decision. Of that's not a DPW issue per se. It's a okay. how they finance it. Do you want to vote on the two water articles together? Yeah, I, I'm fine with them because really, would you and Fred decide what the best way to go on that would be? Ryan and the DPW board and obviously Ryan have their, their piece, and then Fred, Vicki, and the uh, financial advisors and I you know, would obviously come up to some resolution. Right, okay. Yeah, that's where the recommendations would ordinarily come from, their DPW board, as well as our finance people. You know, it's not something that you have to necessarily decide. Well, we're, we're the finance advisors for the town as well, Maureen. Advisor, yeah. That was our advice. Okay. All right. Kristen? I would just make a motion that the select board recommend Articles 17 and 18. So moved. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Next three are the capital ones, uh, so the capital projects and funding sources. We can see all the, uh, the items in the chart there and their uh, associated funding source. We can see that it's broken up just under $900,000 with the use of free cash, capital investment fund, uh, sale of used equipment, and the cemetery lot sales fund um, matches up with the finance committee, and I believe uh, both had unanimously recommended it. The next one would be the roads uh, borrowing. Uh, one of the things was to take it out of the operating budget, um, treat it as a capital item, borrow that money, and have the debt service uh, in their line, in, in that line, um, obviously, to spread it out over a period of time. Uh, that was unanimously recommended, and the same would be for the Butterick windows for this building. Okay, any questions, Christian? Make a motion that the select board recommend articles 19 through 21. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Mm -hmm. And know that these <coughs> require a two thirds vote. Anything to do with money? 
Uh, job, uh, so the personnel bylaw and human resource things, uh, there was one additional change, not additional change, but job classification in Article 22 would be to move it from a grade two to a grade three. That was one thing that was missed last year. The compensation schedule rec uh, reflects the 3% COLA. Same thing for the call fire force. Stipend positions match up with what's in the budget. And the miscellaneous positions moves the uh, seasonal driver uh, whatever the official title is, seasonal truck driver from a maximum of 25 to a maximum of $30 an hour. You want to vote that group together? Motion? Make a motion that the select board recommend articles 22 through 26. So move. Any further discussion? You and I? Sure. Yes, and I. Right. And there's a couple updates and bylaw items, request for a special act in there. Uh, a few meetings ago, you had uh, adopted supporting the Board of Health Regulation bylaw, which would uh, request the mailer for anything going above and beyond Title V. Uh, the Finance Committee um, brought forth the change from tax rate to tax levy in 28, and uh, Chief Gaudet brought the special act to change the age from uh, 65 to 70 for special police officers. Uh, Two-thirds of them were voted uh, unanimously. The request for a special act was 5-1 by the Finance Committee. Special act was what? 5-1. 5 to 1. Five to one. In essence, we really don't have a lot to say about this, do we? It's more of a s state thing. If it would go, it goes to the legislature, so you... Yeah. Kristen? Nothing. Got nothing? Got nothing. David? Okay. This is actually the one that the chief came in and asked us about, right? So I... Obtain a motion. I make a motion that the select board recommend articles 27 through 29. So. All those in favor? I'm sorry. Okay. France and I. Traditionally, citizens' petitions, finance, and select board do not take a place on, and then Article 31 is the uh, open spots. Uh, for the annual town election and the ballot question relative to the expansion of the select board. And no recommendation there. Um, wait, can, one second. So, my understanding is that what we're talking about a ballot question, my understanding is that um, all of the spots are well, we actually have people Positions running Positions are on the ballot for every, there's only one race, which I think is for library trustees. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's going to be on to expand the select board is on there from three to five. Which, I don't see anybody take out papers this year, except me. We haven't had people take out papers. That's my point. Um, and some of these we had to say, please, bravo. Right, Kristen? Make promises. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, but we don't we don't have to vote on that, on this. We're just going to sign off and approve the warrant uh, pursuant to the change that you're going to make tomorrow. Yep. And then we're going to send it off to town council. Legal. Get that back whatever minor changes in there, and then uh, send out the final, final version and get it to the printer. Okay, what's... Now, what do you think? You send it off to council? Usually take a week to, to at the max, so hopefully by the end of the first week in yeah, April we'll get that. we're the only one time. sending them a warrant to look at, right? right? I think so. Okay. 
So I would entertain yes. Okay. Uh, I have committee report in the front of the warrant. I don't need it to send it to town council, so I just need it whatever your final draft okay. is. All right. I, ju I just wanted to know is it going in or not going in? That's up to them, not me. Yeah. I haven't seen it. I think I haven't sent the draft over. I, I didn't even look who it went to, so. I will send the select board a draft. I had sent it to Bill and Fred yeah, I a couple of times. Didn't even look to see uh, who it was sent to, so. Was very long, wasn't it? I think a previous draft they all got, but I'm not sure about the most recent one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've edited it multiple times, and we got the final edits that. The Finance Committee and CBC have weighed in on today. So okay. We would yes. like it dropped into the beginning of the warrant. All right, if you could send it to the three of us, that'd be good. I don't see a problem with it. It's been done in the past. Um, speaking of that, uh, do you have any intentions of doing a PowerPoint at the town meeting or no? You just no, we were just. Going to rely on people actually reading stuff. Either that or have the AI read it for them. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Might take that. Right on that. Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, moving on. I just did a question. You didn't get that moving on thing, Lynn. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, the the citizens' petition on the school. Oh, I forgot How does that... to mention that. Yeah, we don't do anything with that. It goes, it'll be a citizens' petition at the end of the meeting. Will it cause confusion? Yes. But we do have to include it in the warrant. Right. And and so what happens at town meeting? Like if, we, if the lobby voted to approve the school, does anything happen with that? Or is it just a statement? Or how does it work? I believe a vote will be taken on it, right? Yeah. And you're saying, so we say they approve the, um, the budget. Yep. Article 4 and 5 or whatever it is now. And then we get to that, and they're going to go, what? And they vote for that. Right. And what happens? Yeah, what happens? <laughs> question. <laughs> well, I think back to Linda's point, it's just causing a little bit more confusion, but it is a citizen's petition. And, um, you know, maybe it's something that you apply to next year. I'm, I'm not sure. Because when we got that, we had already separated the articles. Right. So. Don't know. Maybe people stay till the end of the meeting. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> All right, maybe not. <laughs> All right, so that's it. On the warrant? Done. Along to the conservation. Yep, so we had gotten the draft just before the meeting. Yes? Could you please vote and sign the warrant? Oh, yeah, we did a motion. I did a motion, but I would accept a motion to sign the warrant pursuant to the changes made and discussed tonight. All those in favor? Newman, I. Okay, Bill, sorry. <laughs> Uh, just before the meeting last week, um, we had received the Conservation Commissioner uh, Intermunicipal Agreement with Rutland. Uh, obviously, we couldn't take action on it last week, so it's on this week's agenda. I know we've been talking about it for a couple of years. To sh uh, years, yeah. Weeks, months. Few, few months, at least, on the radar to share that position. Um, the primary reason we had lost the two that we have had um, was to go to full-time benefited positions, so uh, obviously it wasn't going to happen here. Um, so being able to share with another town is something that was working. Um, our previous agent was working in two towns um, at the same time, these two towns at the same time, but uh, there was nothing formally uh, written up. So should you have any questions, we can get those answered, and if not, we could approve that if you so choose. Has Rutland signed off on it? Yeah, they did last Monday, this oh. Monday. 
So I see that the position, the employee, will be a 100% employee of the town of Rutland. So Are I'll they be... making final decision on the applicant? No, so we'll both be involved in that. And both counts. It states that um, the applicant will learn all the local wetlands protection bylaw and regulations and Rutland stormwater management bylaw. I know we have our own, so should Sterling be added to that? It, 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 uh, it falls to the conservation, so it would follow to everything with the, with the conservation position here because theirs falls under planning officially. I think they wanted to outline that a little bit. Right, that was my other question, is that the position title is assistant planner and conservation agent, and part of the, re part of the requirements were to have a degree in planning or related field um, in, in environmental or wetland science, biology, ecology, or planning and related field. And I would hope that we're gonna make sure that it, the it person is- It is primarily is conservation and stormwater. It's just how they're okay. where they're placing it in their structure. Okay, I just want to make sure that yeah. we know that we want somebody who is more environmental and wetland science than planner. Yes, we got that covered. Very much so. All right. Okay. Can you do? I'll do this. All right. Yeah, I would make a motion that we approve and sign off on a sharing um, agreement with Rutland, the conservation commissioner. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Smith Aye. Aye. All right. And the scholarship just parcel. We still don't have anybody. They're not due until the end of April. I understand that. I just but thought we, we have haven't got anybody. All right. Do you, how are we advertising it? I know I've seen it in the paper. I've seen it on our website. Are the guidance counselors at the yes. school aware of it? Yes. So they're, okay. Anybody else? <laughs> I just want to make sure the guidance counselors know. Because they're the ones Bill's going to put it on our too. Facebook page. I mean, it's, it's already been out there once. Um, you have to do it again. I'll have to do it again. And, um, but as far as, you know, we've only let seniors apply and remember we had discussed should we open it up to people that are already in college, um, you know, maybe they're a freshman and sophomore, can they apply too? And how would that work? I looked at one of the applications. I don't know if you would need to have a separate application for a college student because it just didn't make sense when I read the one application. It didn't yeah. really pertain to a college student, so. Yeah, you don't want, you don't need all the additional. I don't know. What do you think, David? Uh, we'll get some time. I guess we wait a few more weeks and hopefully we get some participation. Okay. Joe? It, it worked last time. So. Yeah. The day oh, before. I'll come in the day before. <laughs> <laughs> we should be able to do it at the last minute. Okay. Do we, uh, we, oh, they we don't get... know April 1st is a deadline for making, giving an acceptance to your college. So they might not know what they're getting and what they're gonna to want to get by April 1st, so that could be. Our deadline for the Scholarship Association, I, I lead in, uh, in Athol, we get 85% of them, you know, in the last 24 hours before it's due and we give out $150,000 a year, so. So the bottom line is no change. At the Sounds moment. good. All right, and then the um, seasonal license for uh, Sterling National. Huh. We're just talking about them huh. in a positive note. Yeah. Uh, we haven't had any issues with them for the years that they've been there. We make a motion to approve the seasonal license for Sterling National. Second. For the discussion? Sure. Grants and I. Um, and then you have your antique permits. And we have our list. Redemption Rock Trading Post, Sterling Rare Coin, Pratt's Junction Antiques, Oh My Gosh Antiques, Average Pierce, and Nouveau Riche Antiques. All seeking their renewals. 
make a motion to approve the antique permits as listed. Sure. Any further discussion? Okay, and then we have, um, again, a reappointment, and it would be for Melissa Chalmers as a registrar. Melissa Chalmers as the registrar. Okay. Any further discussion? Mm -hmm. No. Thank you, Melissa, for Thank stepping you. up and stepping in. And then we have uh, approval of the animal inspection job description. Come had sent that out to us earlier today. I don't know if you all got it, yeah. but um, it's pretty straightforward. Basically, a part-time, non-benefited non -benefited position um, with a stipend compensation. Any questions on that? Just to clarify for everybody, it's not a new position. We've always had an animal Oh, yeah, no. Here, so we're, all right, I just want everyone to know that we're not approving a new position. Yeah, this is not a new position. This is just making sure the job description is updated. And it's actually an appointment by the Board of Health when the applicants come. I mean, they go through Bill as HR, but that's where we are. Make a motion to approve the animal inspector job description. Second. Further discussion? Okay. And uh, the other one, you have letters in your, um, in your packet, and it would be Dedication for the school library. They want to put someone's name up there, and uh, Dr. Riley had suggested that they talk to us as well as the school committee. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd rather not throw out any names. So how do you feel about it? I would make a motion to approve the dedication. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. and I. You guys all right with it too? It does not come before it's so Okay. All right. Well, it's it's not in your name, Linda. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> then, There's still time. <laughs> <laughs> we can amend the motion. <laughs> Was there a name on it? Or, or I'm, out of, I'm out of order. Don't let me get it. <laughs> they want it to be a surprise, so we're not mentioning any names. Uh, we'll talk later. <laughs> okay, that's that. And then, Bill, you have a. Um, Update for us. Sure. There's a current vacancy uh, for a police officer uh, due to retirement coming up in the next month or so. So that position has been posted and they are receiving applications. Um, obviously, we've taken care of the budget and the warrant items. Uh, so I'll make the changes uh, on the recommendations and the uh, vote to combine the two articles today and send out a different uh, draft tomorrow. Also send it over to town council for review. Um, we only received the one proposal from GRLA. Uh, there was a couple other we sent out to um, for the windows, building envelope services here. So you can see their proposal. We had discussed it at last meeting as something um, we're looking to do, and obviously it's an item on the warrant. Uh, GRLA is the same company that was the engineer and architect on the roof. So this would get us, uh, obviously, designs, get us through the construction documents, uh, the bidding, the construction administration, uh, and there's necessary site visits um, through the construction administration as well. Um, they did a good job with the roof, so I don't see an issue with them. I was hoping just, you know, price-wise that we'd see what other, other companies would have out there, but um, they did not return any. The buses. Alright. If we have no issue with that, then we can move on um, and, and work with them. If not, then uh, I can send it back out to other companies or whatever you want to do. Alright, well, I would entertain a motion that we um, have Bill move forward with you know, for the window. So moved. 
All those in favor? Newman, aye. Smith, aye. Okay. Move forward, young man. Very good. Uh, Townwide cleanup. I don't know if David has anything to add, but that will be on 5 4 at the DPW. It will co locate with their uh, open, open house. house. Are you setting up down there? Yes, we are. Well, last I Ghost? heard, you were going to go to the um, Sterling Municipal Light, you know, which is a little bit more in your face. Well, the plan was to do it there because it ties in with their open house and we thought we could get more people involved. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's going to be a very busy downtown. Yes, it is. I heard it will be fun that way. Right. <laughs> I do believe that's well, maybe what I we can set something up over SMLD to just make it that much more interesting from one end of town to the other. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, that's the day of the community lunch over at the church, and then mm -hmm. you have the first day of the Sterling Market. Mm -hmm. So you guys want to go all the way down to DPW. Okay. Well, it's your party. No, it's anyway. your party, Dave. We gave it to you. You do the best. <laughs> You're driving you. anyway. It's another half mile. Park <laughs> <laughs> uh, Huh? Town, <laughs> town meeting is on the 6th at 5.30 at the Chocset Gym. Uh, the election is at the Houghton Gym, 5.13 from 12 to 7, as you folks had approved. Uh, Ryan and I have been working on the scope of work uh, with the plans that we had received for the beach work, and we are working currently on the erosion control quotes, uh, the P-stone trench that goes along the parking lot, grading the parking lot to shift the water in a different direction, uh, we have done the infiltration uh, pit, which obviously is doing more than what it needs to right now um, in terms of where the water is flowing off. It's, it's collecting more water than it should. Um, so the trench and then the rain garden that will go along with that. So we're hoping to get that going uh, very soon because the grant funds that are here uh, need to be expended by the end of the year. Uh, also the work on Maple Street sidewalks onto Bird Street. Uh, that was awarded to Lazaro Paving. That bid went out in the fall. We've completed all the contract documents with the DPW, and they're going to start um, hopefully shortly after the uh, asphalt plants open up, maybe next week or the week after, depending on the weather. Um, the MVP grant we are um, working on is going to be the one, that, the project that we're focusing on is the pump station roadway um, that continuously gets flooded at any time um, there's pretty significant rains. That's the East Wachusett Brook that goes alongside it and f um, goes out into the still water. Um, obviously getting access to your water pump station out there is uh, critical, so we are uh, putting together a grant proposal to see if we can get a feasibility study and proposals on what we can do to try and mitigate that. Um, so we're now currently working on some of the um, letters of support from our legislators. Um, it'll be on our next agenda for one from the select board. Or do we already have that? Not yet. Um, planning board, uh, DCR is going to contribute one. We're working to try and get one from DEP as well and conservation. So um, trying to get those along with um, some information from our consultant that would eventually be working on that project with us um, to get that going. Obviously, the other part is going to be the one-stop grant applications. Uh, we would be applying for a MassWorks grant for the downtown project. Um, we have to have 25% grant match, which is why we've kept so much of our ARPA funding. Um, we have to have 75% uh, engineering plans, which we are pretty much there. Obviously, a cost estimate to see where we are um, and what that gap might be and uh, work on some of the permits, whether it's conservation, DOT, or otherwise. Um, so those are the two big ones that we're working on right now. MVP is um, front of mind since the application date is much closer. Uh, it's not until June for the one stop, so we'll have a little bit of time on that. Um, the current set of plans has not really changed too much on the, uh, the downtown piece. So. The last set I think we got in November is pretty much the same place where we were. It's just changing materials right now on a couple items. So I'm um, working pretty quickly to try and get that piece 
done and over to the necessary boards to start chopping that around, but we got to get to a point where we can do that with pretty good confidence. Um, otherwise, I think those are the major items. Do you have any questions, comments, concerns, or other? We're done. We're working on it. We got a lot of a lot of grant funds to spend before the end of the fiscal year between the engineering, the, the beach work, um, Maple Street and Bird Street. Um, yeah, it's yeah, we got some things going on. Okay. So a couple of things. First of all, I want to publicly thank all of those that did step up and stop in and get papers to run for some of these boards. Um, that are out there, you know, it's it really is a begging, pleading, groveling for people to do these things, um, which I get, you know, it's time consuming for, for a lot of people. Um, also, just a couple of things, we already talked about the cleanup, and then uh, tomorrow we have the Friends of the Sterling Senior Breakfast, which everybody's invited to, uh, it's from 7.30 to 9.00. And tomorrow, at least Bill and I will be off reading to, going back to elementary school and doing a community reading program over there for an hour or so. And then it's Easter already, believe it or not. I mean, it'd be nice if the ice was gone first, but um, it's Easter. I finally got the day off. What would you like? <laughs> Just thank the recreation department too for the Easter. Oh, the Easter weekend. Event, yeah. so I, my kids are grown, so I had my niece and nephew out there. Yeah, very well attended and always good, good to time for everybody. Yeah. yeah, it's very well run. So, yep. thank you, them. David, I just like to throw out there that the DPW is uh, looking for volunteers to serve on their DPW building committee. So if uh, there are any interested people in signing up for that, they should do so. The information is on the town website. Okay, so that was, you're on that, and then we need somebody from finance? I believe so. And then two members of the community? Correct. We have somebody from finance. We have somebody. Okay. <laughs> Would you miss the meeting, Paul? Paul didn't step back. Right. <laughs> Welcome to the club. Yeah, that's what happens when you, know, you don't show up, you got to get voted into something. Ask Dick Mackey. All right. Otherwise, everybody all set? What? We have, we have pending business about a letter to the superintendent. I realize based on... Right. You and I discussed that on the 13th of yeah, March. Yeah, I forgot. I'm sorry. Um, we have to take that back and potentially revise it in light of the discussion about the single okay. uh, article tonight, okay? I, I'm sorry, I totally forgot that we were going to discuss that. Sometimes you have to tickle my brain, you know? I'll learn that. Right now. Okay, so... So we need to take that back to committee, Maureen, okay. first, and then represent it to the select board or hopefully co-signature with the with the finance committee. The other thing is a second tier to this. this. The second item that I wanted to mention is we had discussed having a five-town meeting right. around school financing mm -hmm. and organizing that and wanted to get select board support for that as well. I had sent you and Bill a note about that. Yeah. Uh, and organizing that and potentially hosting it as well if we if we feel strongly about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we think a town to town collaboration would be a good thing on that because the the budget's pushing everybody to a two and a half override right mm -hmm. now. And it's the school budgets that are doing that. So there has to be uh, <coughs> we probably wouldn't have felt as strongly about the second article if it was moderated rather than what it was. So I think the purpose of that would be to figure out how do we get moderation in the over the minimum contribution piece of it going forward. And are you looking to do that for this budget? It's too late. 
We're looking to start the process anyway. I don't know whether it could have any effect on this budget right. here or not, or any votes in any towns. Uh, but it certainly has to be accomplished. We have to get together as a district and start talking. Well, you know our town administrators all get together and have this discussion as well. And we depend on them to bring it back to us. Um, and then you have the school committee who also, I mean, we can always have them come and report. Um, so we would have to, would really have to take a vote at the next meeting because I did forget totally to put it on the agenda. Um, Unless I could slide it in as no. <laughs> uh, I was going to try. But um, okay, so could you put that on the next agenda? It's to the district plus the legislature, but you're going to send me a new one on that, or send us a new one on that? Yes. Okay. And I can copy comma on that so that we can get it successfully yeah, on the map. going to really care that much, <laughs> unless you're going to do it tonight. Okay. Now, she'll be, uh, when do you leave? The 4th. The 4th. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> oh, man. Thank Bye, you, Mark. Thank you, Linda. Yeah. Those are my two items. All right. Thank I you. totally forgot Joanne. I'm so sorry. Because um, I have nothing else to do with it. I don't anything. All right. I would entertain a motion. Motion to adjourn. Move. And I'll also adjourn the finance committee. Oh, yeah. So you might want these. I don't know. Do you want them? This is all your presentation. Yep. I make a motion to adjourn the 